Let's go see the 3D body movies. To view a movie, click on one of the five movie icons displayed across the bottom of the screen. Use the scroll buttons to display additional movie icons. Click on the 3D button to see the movies in 3D stereo. Brainstem. Pituitary. Cerebellum. Occipital lobe. Parietal lobe. Temporal lobe. Frontal lobe. Cerebrum. Pinna Eardrum Ossicles Semicircular canals Cochlea Cranial nerve 8 Right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery. Left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle. Aortic valve, aorta. Femur, pelvis, sternum, cervical spine. Thoracic spine. Lung. 
lumbar spine. Scapula. Cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, Muscle cell, myofibril, actin, myosin. Muscles. Right atrium. Tricuspid valve. Right ventricle. Atrioventricular valve. Pulmonary valve. Pulmonary artery. Left atrium. Left ventricle. Aortic valve. Aorta.
Retina. Sclera, retina, lens, iris, cornea. Let's explore the visible body. Move the mouse to travel through the body from head to toe. Click the mouse to restore the cursor. Move the cursor over the body to display the names of the body parts. Let's take a spin around the body. To view an organ model, click on one of the organ icons displayed on either side of the screen. Move the mouse to spin the organ models. Click on the 3D button to see the models in 3D stereo.
The gallbladder is a small sac which sits just beneath the liver. Its only role is to concentrate bile and then release it when food is passing through the small intestine. Bile is a sticky green fluid produced by the liver. Bile serves both as a fluid which helps the body to absorb fats and as a way to eliminate toxins. All the liver cells make bile at a constant rate. The bile is released into a network of bile ducts that all come together to form the common hepatic duct. The gallbladder is connected to the common hepatic duct by the cystic duct. Most of the time bile flows up the cystic duct and into the gallbladder for storage. When food passes from the stomach into the duodenum, however, a hormone, cholecystokinin, is released which signals the gallbladder to contract. The bile is squeezed back up through the cystic duct and down the common bile duct into the small intestine. The lungs are a vital organ which enables the body to obtain oxygen from the air we breathe and to eliminate carbon dioxide. Breathing is accomplished with the chest wall muscles and the diaphragm muscle which separates the chest cavity from the abdomen. When the chest cavity expands, the lungs expand with it, drawing air down into the lungs. When the chest cavity relaxes, the lungs shrink and waste carbon dioxide is expelled. The lungs are not directly attached to the chest wall. Instead, they are encased in a double layer membrane called the pleura. One of the pleural layers is firmly attached to the lungs, with the other one firmly attached to the chest wall. There's always a small amount of fluid between the two pleural layers, which allows them to freely slide over each other. The lungs are divided into distinct lobes, which are supplied by their own airways, bronchi, and their own arteries. On the right side, there are three main lobes called the upper, middle, and lower lobes. On the left, there are only two lobes called the upper and lower lobes. This anatomy is illustrated in the 3D model above. The fissures that separate the upper and lower lobes on both sides are called the major fissures. The right lung also has a minor fissure that separates the upper and middle lobes. Notice how the minor fissure is nearly horizontal, but the major fissures run at a steep angle. When a doctor listens to the breathing sounds on your back, he or she is listening to the lower lobes, even when the stethoscope is placed high up by the shoulder blades. One of the disorders sometimes seen in the emergency room is collapse of the lung. Surprisingly, the natural tendency of the lungs is to collapse into a small ball near the center of the chest. They are held in their normal expanded state only by the attraction between the two layers of the pleura. If you have ever tried to separate two sheets of wet glass, then you know how this works. Occasionally, air gets between the two pleural layers, causing them to separate, and the lung collapses. This is called a pneumothorax, meaning air in the thorax, chest cavity. The air can either come from the outside because of a penetrating wound, or from the inside because a part of the lung developed a hole in it. Another problem that is sometimes seen is excess water between the two pleural layers. This is called a pleural effusion, a condition commonly referred to as water on the lung. There are many causes for a pleural effusion, some benign and some quite bad. A pleural effusion is typically treated by sticking a needle or a tube into the chest and draining out the fluid. The ear is the organ of hearing and balance. The ear is commonly divided into the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The largest part of the outer ear is the pinna, which is designed to channel sound waves into the ear canal. 
At the end of the ear canal is the eardrum, tympanic membrane. The eardrum is part of the middle ear along with three tiny bones, ossicles, that form a chain. These bones are the malleus, hammer, incus, anvil, and stapes, stirrup. The airspace within the middle ear is blocked from the outside by the eardrum, but it does connect to the throat via the eustachian tube. The inner ear consists of the cochlea, the semicircular canals, and the eighth cranial nerve. The base of the stapes fills the oval window which serves as the entrance to the inner ear. The eye is a complex organ that provides the sense of sight. The eyeball has a tough outer coat called the sclera, which forms the white part of the eye. The circular, most forward part of the eye is called the cornea. The cornea is transparent. Behind the cornea is a fluid-filled space called the aqueous humor, watery fluid. Moving further back, there is the colored part of the eye called the iris, with a black hole in its center called the pupil. The iris changes the size of the pupil in response to changes in brightness. Directly behind the iris is the lens. The lens changes shape to help focus the light rays entering the eye. But surprisingly, most of the focusing of light rays is done by the cornea. The main body of the eye behind the lens is filled with a clear gel called the vitreous humor. At the very back of the eye is the retina. The light rays fall on the retina, which converts those light rays into signals that are processed by the brain, allowing us to see. The eyeball itself is moved by six delicate muscles called the ocular muscles. Four of these muscles are shown in the 3D model above. The surface of the cerebral hemispheres is folded into deep fissures, sulci, and bumps, gyri, which triple the total surface area. The most prominent sulci are used to divide each cerebral hemisphere into four main lobes. For example, the central sulci separate the frontal lobes from the parietal lobes. In the 3D model above, the frontal lobes are shown in light blue, the parietal lobes in pink, the temporal lobes in dark blue, and the occipital lobes in green. These lobes have the same names as the skull bones that overlie them. Besides the all-important cerebral hemispheres, the other large structures of the brain visible in the 3D model above are the cerebellum, shown in yellow, and the brain stem, which is shown in orange. The brain stem is the most primitive part of the brain. It is responsible for sustaining the basic functions of life such as breathing and blood pressure regulation. The brainstem directs these functions without any conscious intervention. The last structure visible in the 3D model above is the pituitary. It is seen as a small reddish ball protruding from the bottom of the frontal lobes. The pituitary is the master gland in the body. It has significant influence over many of the body's processes. The pituitary controls these functions by releasing hormones. Hormones are chemicals that are released into the blood and carried to distant parts of the body where they exert their effects. Two of the many pituitary hormones are thyroid stimulating hormone, which controls the thyroid gland, and growth hormone, which stimulates cell division and growth. The skull consists of the cranium, which surrounds the delicate brain and the facial bones. The cranium is formed by eight bones, the frontal bone, two parietal bones, two temporal bones, the occipital bone in the back, the ethmoid bone behind the nose, and the sphenoid bone. 
The face consists of 14 bones, including the maxilla, upper jaw, and mandible, lower jaw. The bones of the skull are quite hard, and protection of the brain is undoubtedly their most important function. Interestingly, several of the bones are hollow, a feature which reduces their weight. Imagine how heavy your head might feel after a long day if these bones weren't hollow. These air-filled spaces are called the paranasal sinuses because they are located all around the nose. The membranes which line the sinuses sometimes become inflamed because of allergy or infection. This is a common condition referred to as sinusitis. All the skull bones, except the mandible, are held together by immovable joints called sutures. The mandible and the two temporal bones are held together by freely movable joints, which are named, not surprisingly, the temporomandibular joints, TMJ. The TMJs usually work well to permit all the complex motions required for chewing and talking. Some people, however, develop pain in their TMJs. This condition is called temporomandibular joint syndrome. TMJ syndrome is usually the result of spasm of the chewing muscles. Headaches, facial pain, and various popping noises are all common in patients with TMJ syndrome. Treatment is generally directed at reducing the muscle spasms and relieving the pain. Besides protecting the brain, the other major function of the skull is to house the special sense organs. The eyes, vision, ears, hearing, nose, smell, and tongue, taste, are all located in the skull. The sense of taste is accomplished by the approximately 10,000 taste buds. These are mostly located on the tongue, with a few located at the back of the throat. Surprisingly, there are only four different tastes that can be differentiated by the taste buds alone. Bitter, salty, sour, and sweet. The taste buds for each of these four different tastes are grouped together on the tongue. Of note, the taste buds for sweet are all located at the very tip of the tongue. Our ability to distinguish a rich range of tastes is actually due to our sense of smell, which is much more developed than our sense of taste. The sense of smell is accomplished by special nerve endings that all sit in a small region in the roof of the nose. Our sense of smell is remarkably sensitive. As few as four individual molecules can produce a recognizable smell. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint which connects the arm with the body. Three bones come together to form the shoulder joint. These bones are the humerus, arm, the clavicle, collarbone, and the scapula, shoulder blade. The deltoid muscle sits on top of the upper arm and shoulder. This powerful muscle works to lift the arm away from the body. There's a fluid-filled cavity under the deltoid muscle which serves to reduce friction between the muscle and the underlying joint. Occasionally, this cavity becomes inflamed and painful because of excessive motion. This condition is called bursitis. Bursitis can also occur at a number of other joints, including the elbow and knee. The tendons of four muscles merge together around the shoulder joint to form a reinforcing structure called the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff can be damaged by excessive stress. This is why rotator cuff injuries are common among professional athletes especially baseball pitchers and football quarterbacks. Another common problem is dislocation of the shoulder. In this case, the top of the arm, humeral head, comes out of its normal socket, glenoid cavity. Some people have relatively lax shoulder muscles and are prone to shoulder dislocations. The elbow is the hinge joint which connects the lower end of the humerus with the upper ends of the radius and ulna. The elbow permits the arm to be bent by the powerful biceps muscle and then straightened by the triceps muscle. The biceps and triceps thus form a pair of muscles which have opposite actions. It is a general rule that the muscles of the body are organized into pairs or groups which have opposite actions. The elbow also allows the forearm to be rotated without moving the upper arm. 
This is very important for some actions, such as turning a doorknob. This rotation motion is called either supination or pronation. Supination is the action of turning the palm face up when the arm is held straight out, away from the body. Pronation is the action of turning the palm face down when the arm is held straight out. Following the general rule, these important movements are accomplished by a pair of muscles with opposite actions. The words supination and pronation are related to the words supine, which means to lie face up, and prone, which means to lie face down. Repetitive motions can strain the tendons of the elbow and cause pain. Tennis elbow and golfer's elbow are common conditions resulting from overuse and strain of the elbow tendons. Most everyone has felt the pins and needles sensation caused by hitting the tip of their elbow. This is often referred to as hitting the funny bone. The temporary pain is caused by impingement of the ulnar nerve, which travels through a narrow groove close to the surface of the skin as it passes over the elbow. The hand is the most versatile part of the skeleton. It enables people to grasp and manipulate objects. The hand is comprised of the wrist, carpals, palm, metacarpals, and fingers, phalanges. There are three main nerves which travel to the hand, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, and the radial nerve. Each of these three nerves connects with a specific part of the hand to permit movement and sensation. Intricate hand movements are achieved by using the small muscles that are contained entirely within the hand, the intrinsic muscles, and the much larger forearm muscles. The forearm muscles are connected to the bones of the hand by long tendons. Tendons and ligaments are often confused with one another. A tendon is the fibrous attachment of a muscle to a bone. A ligament is a fibrous attachment between bones. The spine is comprised of 26 vertebral bones. From the top to the bottom, there are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. The sacrum is comprised of five fused bones, while the coccyx is formed from four fused bones. The lumbar section of the spine is shown in the 3D model above. Each vertebral bone connects to the vertebrae above and below it by two facet joints. There are also fibrous discs that separate the bones of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar sections of the spine. Interestingly, these tough intervertebral discs have a jelly-like core. The facet joints give the spine its flexibility while the discs cushion the vertebral bones during activities like running or jumping. The transverse and posterior spinous processes are the primary attachment points for the numerous muscles which hold up the spine. The pelvis serves to support the upper body and to protect the lower abdominal and pelvic organs. It consists of the two large hip bones and the sacrum. The sacrum is the triangular bone that also forms the lower part of the spinal column. The hip bones are firmly joined to the sacrum in the back and joined to each other in the front. This structure creates a very strong and rigid ring of bone. Each hip bone is composed of three fused bones. The knee is the hinge joint that connects the main bones of the leg, the femur, and the tibia. The kneecap, patella, lies over the front of the joint. 
There are strong ligaments on both sides of the joint, called the medial and lateral collateral ligaments. There are also two ligaments within the joint, called the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. The ankle is a hinge joint connecting the bones of the lower leg, tibia and fibula, and the uppermost bone of the foot, talus. The ankle is held together by several strong ligaments which provide stability and prevent excessive movement. The ankle only allows simple upward and downward motions of the foot. Other foot movements require motion of the joints within the foot itself. Because the ankle is subject to great stress, sprains of the ankle ligaments are very common. Each foot has 26 separate bones. The two largest foot bones are the calcaneus, heel bone, and the talus. Long tendons attach many of the bones of the foot to strong muscles located in the lower leg. These tendons can be seen in the 3D model shown above. There are a number of disorders that are frequently seen in the foot. These include corns, bunions, and gout. Corns are small areas of thickened skin, usually caused by tight-fitting shoes. A bunion is a firm, fluid-filled lesion that forms over the base of the big toe. Like corns, bunions are usually the result of wearing tight, pointed shoes. Bunions sometimes require surgical removal and reconstruction of the great toe to prevent them from recurring. Gout is a form of arthritis that commonly affects the joint of the great toe. Gout results from the formation of uric acid crystals within a joint. These crystals cause significant inflammation and pain in the affected joint. A person suffering from an attack of gout in the great toe is generally unable to even stand on the foot. Unlike corns and bunions, which are more common in women, gout is ten times more common in men. Let's play Body Recall. Click on one of the 12 tiles to see what lies beneath it. Remember what you see. Concentration is the key. The object of the game is to match each picture with its name or with its function. Lungs. Save the patient. It's up to you.
the brain. This photograph shows a human brain. Neuron. The basic function of the nervous. Antibodies. This Microvilli. The photograph at left shows a close-up of a mucosal cell which lines the inside of the small intestine. Each of the tiny finger-like projections on this cell's surface are called microvilli. If we were further away, we could see that the inner lining of the small intestine is itself organized into many small finger-like projections called villi. The villi and microvilli together create a surface area within the small intestine that is as large as a tennis court. Endoscopy. The photograph at left shows the inside of a normal duodenum as seen through an endoscope. An endoscope is a flexible tube with both a light and a camera lens at its end. Doctors often use the endoscope to examine the digestive tract. When a patient develops vomiting or diarrhea, it doesn't resolve as expected. Tiny... The small intestine. The illustration at left depicts... Rotavirus. The illustration at left shows a single rotavirus. Worldwide, it is one of the most common viruses that can infect the digestive system and cause gastroenteritis. The rotavirus is easily spread from person to person in a family or other group setting. you have been transported into the patient's brain. To cure this patient, you need to find all 10 of the viruses and zap them. Remember that he was bitten by a mad dog just yesterday. Avoid damaging healthy cells as it will cost you valuable time. Oh no, you zapped a nerve cell. No, you zapped a red blood cell. Congratulations, you have cured the patient from a rabies virus infection. Rabies is a viral infection of the nervous system. been transported into the patient's heart to help the Excellent job. The patient will recover from his heart attack thanks to you. Complete blockage of a coronary This is a disease which results in narrowed arteries and decreased blood flow.
Shh. <laughs> 